Yeah, let's see. Where are you? You should be in the mix right now, right? This is uh, Libby's mic. Ah, okay. Let's try once again. You're not here, Libby. I'm not here. I really am here. Try this again. This this mic is turned on. Okay. Maybe you should be talking in that one, all right? Oh, there I we are. There we there are. Is. There so, we are. So, good, good, good. I'll just talk to this one. Yes, that's great. Is that okay with you, Asia? You want to put that over there? Okay, good. Thanks. So, uh, uh, I hope you will all understand that we're all volunteers here, and I'm so pleased that Libby drove all the ways up here, and uh, we have uh, we have uh, Asia here helping us uh, with our technical. Uh, aspects of it, which uh, I would not have been able to manage myself. Thank you so much, Asia, for being here this morning. I appreciate it. And thank you for coming, Libby. Libby uh, has been described by the Washington Post as, quote, expert, and by the San Francisco Chronicle, dazzling, and absolutely exquisite by the Paris Transatlantic. And, uh, you know, Libby, as a uh, former uh, oboe player, I find all of those appropriate in describing the extraordinary work you've done over oh, the years. Oh, you're, you're way too kind. Well, no, 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 no. Besides being a uh, oboist, uh, Libby uh, is an author. She's published uh, several books, right? Two, two books, one which has gone in second uh, edition, so but so basically two books. And the names of the books are? Um, the book that's especially pertinent to today's uh, uh, experience is, is a book called Oboe Unbound, right. which was a, is a, uh, a, a manual for how to perform extended techniques on the instrument, on the oboe. Uh, I always say that it appeals to 17 people in the <laughs> on the earth but those 17 people 17 really need it <laughs> people. 17 people yeah. i've heard you know uh, it's the most obscure nerdy thing you could possibly do but i get these these fan letters every so often you've saved my life and it's like wow this well, is let's be honest one. about it you uh, <laughs> the reality is that uh, libby has basically written the bible and she used a term extended techniques on the oboe uh, this is, I think, in the 60-year history. We don't have an archivist here, as you probably have at Yale. Uh, but I think in the 60-year history of WPKN, we've probably never had an oboist live on the air. So I'm wondering uh, if you would explain to our listeners, what is extended technique? A, a very good question. Um, so if, if you go to conservatory, if you even take lessons when you're in elementary school, as I did all of the above, uh, you're taught to play the oboe in a kind of a standard way to play standard repertoire. And, and that uh, standard repertoire would be Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, the whole shebang, right? Y yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you, it's almost funny, they talk in, in, um, in, vocal, uh, in the vocal world as of like the bel canto style. So this is you're taught to play with a beautiful tone and to play uh, in tune and in a tempered scale, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, around about the late 60s, early 70s, uh, classical musicians were play paying a lot of attention to what was going on with free jazz, and just in general, things were opening up. Yeah. And people were really looking to explore uh, the other kinds of sounds that an instrument could make. Yeah. Uh, very pertinent to the piece I'll be playing. Um, uh, very, but, you know, I'm just going to jump in here right away and, 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 and detour a little bit to say I was very interested in extended techniques already. But when I was a, uh, an undergraduate in college, Bowdoin College, around about 1977, there was a visit by none other than Pauline Oliveras, uh -huh. Malcolm Goldstein, uh -huh. and this weird oboe player named Joseph Jolly. You know, I don't remember this. <laughs> you played you have mentioned this at several my times college <laughs> in the past. I don't remember being at Bowdoin College with Pauline. Oh my! Well, I'm pretty sure you were with Pauline, you, but you certainly were with with yeah. Ma Malcolm. I I thought that Pauline brought you, uh -huh. um, but anyway, uh, but it made a huge impression. I went off and bought your LP organic oh, wow. oboe, that <laughs> orange. Well, LP. When you talk about uh, <laughs> when you talk about selling seventeen books, we probably sold seventeen copies <laughs> of that LP. I think I bought two of them. I bought the LP and the CD. <laughs> so I'm your Thank biggest you so fan. Much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, uh, you've gone on to really uh, expand the repertoire. 
for the oboe uh, with uh, many composers, uh, commissions, and uh, maybe you can mention some of the composers you've worked with. Uh, yes, you know, one of the people that you um, asked me about, um, and I'm playing Eleanor Hubda rather than uh, this other composer, but it, it was uh, the wonderful composer, um, Anaya Lockwood, who, right. who just so enjoyed working with her. Still enjoy a great friendship. Uh, you know, a composer who has been so close to my heart and has written beautiful pieces for me, um, who recently died, is, is um, Ingram Marshall. Right. And I'm actually getting ready in a couple of weeks to go to San Francisco to do this huge memorial concert for him, um, where I'll be playing Dark Waters with one of the pieces mm -hmm. he wrote for me, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful piece for English horn with electronics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, done quite a bit of work with uh, this 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 young man named Jack Vies, who sure, I ha sure, happen sure. to be married to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and he's written quite a few pieces, including a piece called Apocrypha, which also has uh, some extended techniques and uh, electronics. And we did a beautiful um, uh, video of that, so you can actually see that on YouTube as well as... And uh, where, where could people find that? That one, just just uh, go to YouTube and, and go to uh, either write Libby Van Cleave or Jack Vies and the piece Apocrypha. Okay, great. Um, and yeah, it'll, it'll pop right up. Yeah. I want to get back to, uh, for a moment, we were talking about extended uh, techniques. And uh, you were alluding to how, uh, in contrast to the traditional historic and, let's say, classical way of playing the instrument, one of the things that uh, began to be discovered in the 60s, and which you've certainly explored and then ended up writing a book about, is that all of these instruments have the possibility not just of playing one melodic note, as was the history for several hundred years, but in fact having the ability of playing what we call multi-phonics, multi-pitches, right? And uh, your book documents that so clearly in terms of how to do that, right? I remember one of the first books I saw, which was not so appropriate for uh, the instruments we were using, was by <coughs> an Italian uh, oboist, Bertolozzi, right? And uh, he, um, he would give you all of these fingerings for these various kinds of multiphonics, and I spent, I don't know, hundreds of hours <laughs> trying to learn how to play them, but none of them worked for me. Uh, but you, your book really is more appropriate for what American oboists are doing. Yeah, that was, that was really one of my goals. Actually, Corey Bartolozzi, he was so important, and, yeah, and yeah, he, yeah. he was groundbreaking. Yeah. And of course, his fingerings don't work for anybody. Plus, it, plus they also, um, he used a notational system that was really clunky. I mean, you had to kind of have, like some of these keys would have numbers, and you have to always be looking at the diagram. It's just <laughs> a big pain. Um, my book was not the first for oboe, that w the first g really good book for oboe. The f I would say one of the first really good books for oboe was by, by a guy named Peter Veal. And he was a student of Holliger's. He, he was really exhaustive. He'd, he'd taken like a spectrometer and he measured all the all the multiphonics. Uh -huh. And this uh -huh. was every, every I, guess, <laughs> I can't say the, the D word on radio, can I? Well, like, dar every darn every thing, darn word. every darn thing you could do on the oboe. And when he, he wrote that book, I thought, okay, he's done that. I don't have to do it. And I can do it, my book. And I did something is so funny because almost everybody who's written these books would go back to women's history. Um, they're almost all guys, uh -huh. and they yeah. almost all go to their cave and they do their brilliant work and they come out with this yeah. brilliant object. Well, you know, I'm a gal, and I I thought to myself, I want to have not just you know a, a good list, but I want to have a list that's really reliable, that works for everybody. So I got together with five of my pals. And I sent all around the country. I found people <laughs> who had different teachers and different reed styles, yeah. different oboes. Yeah. Because there's a few different makes of oboes that are uh, frequently played <laughs> in, in America. Um, and I said, does this work for you? Right. And if it, if it worked for, I think I had, I was pretty stringent. It was like four out of five. It had to work uh, for uh -huh. at least four uh -huh. out of five. And even if it was a, a yeah. weird, clunky, nor terrible sound that I loved really deeply, right. I didn't put it in the book if, if, if it didn't work for four mm -hmm. out of the five people. So it was, again, I've always thought it was kind of funny. It's like, you know, girls, we tend to talk to our friends about <laughs> things, you know, <laughs> need to share, need to share, you know. Now, so that's you know, how that uh, worked out. Libby, we're uh, celebrating Women's History uh, Month uh, internationally and here at WPKN. And I'm curious because um, I know that when I was uh, studying at a young age, most of the principal oboe players in the uh, major orchestras uh, usually the first, second, and even third chair were all males. 
Has that changed very much? Oh, yes, it certainly oh, has. Good. Yeah, yeah, no, it has. Some of the major oboe players are, are females. Carolyn Hub, I think about in, um, in, in Los Angeles. Nancy Obermuth King, um, not an orchestral, principally an orchestral player, but major, major teacher in, in yeah. Michigan. Lots of, lot, I mean, I, I, the list could go on and on and good, on. Good, 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 good. Um, so there's been a, a better equilibrium over the last 20 years oh, yes. in terms of representation. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, you mentioned Eleanor Havda, uh, a woman that, a uh, composer that we both loved uh, tremendously. And uh, she wrote a lot of music for you. Well, we had the just absolutely hugely joyful uh, and very creatively blossoming uh, experience of working with uh, the Nancy Meehan Dance Company. Right. Um, and uh, and there's much that could be said about Eleanor. Uh, I mean, you know, her brilliance, her creative approach, et cetera. But one of the things, of course, is, is uh, I, it's interesting. I hadn't put this together till this moment. If we're talking about women's history, she had studied composition standard way. She uh -huh. really fancy pedigree, yep, yep, and yep. lots and lots of high the level. The best of the best. The best of the best. But then she decided she was going to study choreography, uh -huh. um, and she got. I think she got an MFA in choreography, um, and it was because she was very interested in sort of space and the kind of the way p dancers thought about time and rhythm, but also. This was an, uh, this was a, a discipline that was where women had really yeah. shaped it. Right. So that was a, just another really mm. interesting thing in terms of a feminine approach versus mm -hmm. an, a male approach. Because yeah. obviously, she, well, maybe not obvious. She'd studied all the guys because yeah. back then, if, that's who, those yeah. are the people who were teaching. Yeah. Uh, as uh, Libby gets ready to do a performance, uh, what is the piece you're going to be playing, Libby? Uh, the piece is called Joe Hawk Hu. Joe Hawk Hu. Um, and it's a very short piece. Um, you and I already decided that what we would do is I would play it and then we would talk about it a little bit and then I'd play it again. Um, I, I guess I would say just as a, a preliminary um, introduction to the piece, um, Joe Hak Hyu is a um, Japanese sort of aesthetic uh, principle. Um, and I apologize to anybody who knows more about this than I was probably a lot of people out there. <laughs> but my <laughs> understanding about Joe Hak Hyu is that it... it um, Joe is sort of like the 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 beginning. Uh -huh. uh, ha is like a sort of a scattering, and Q is like rush to finish. Uh -huh. um, and the idea of Joe Ha Q is that the whole piece is Joe Ha Q. Uh, the phrases are Joe Ha Q. Each individual note is Joe Ha Q. So like a fractal thing, where, uh -huh. where which um, if if I think about that too much, I I can't. Yeah. Pick up the oboe player because it's too, too okay. mind for me. <laughs> As Libby gets uh, prepared to play, uh, just a reminder to everyone. We are doing a live video stream right now. You can actually see Libby uh, performing here. And uh, Libby, if you need to warm up a moment, certainly go ahead and do so. There, she's warming up. And... Uh, uh, so you can actually see a live performance of an oboist, possibly the first time in the 60 years of this uh, auspicious radio station, the world's greatest radio station, as they say in the vernacular. Uh, so you can go to YouTube, WPKN, and there's a button there that says live. You should be able to find it there. Or you can go to my Facebook page. Joseph Celli, C-E-L-L-I, and I would really like it if some of you did so, because we'd like to get some response. We've never done this before, and uh, we'd like to do it. So here, without further introduction, is Libby Van Cleef, the premier performance after 60 years at WPKN of a solo oboe performance. Hit it, Libby. Thank Here we go.
Yeah. If you're out there in Newtown, start applauding. If you're up in Monroe, please grab a seat. Uh, Libby. Thank you, Libby. Now, uh, you'll notice in that performance uh, that uh, Libby was doing not overtly big theatrical things, but uh, she was doing uh, a little bit of theatrical things, which are part of the score and which are part of the uh, the breathing and the making those uh, hissing sounds and air sounds. That's part of it, correct? Yes, yeah. Um, Eleanor really wanted sort of continuous energy. She wanted she wanted a piece that just started and went the whole time. And we it did all these experiments. One of the things, you know, I played it with for a friend last night, and, and, uh, and he said, you really need to talk about how collaborative this piece was. Because, I mean, it was very much a, 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 work, a, a work that we did very closely together. Anyway, um, so she wanted she wanted a sense of continuous energy, and um, we tried many things. We tried to 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 have circular breathing through the through the entire piece, um, et cetera. Um, and we we um, we we tried um, we tried uh, to have have uh, actually breathing out and in through mm -hmm. the oboe, mm -hmm. which you know, of course, we tried all the yeah. weird things that there are. But uh, we ended up deciding she wanted to choreograph the breath as kind of the way to now, get continuous energy. It's, it, you just said a couple of really interesting things. You said she wanted to choreograph the bre breath. And earlier in our discussion, you talked about how she studied choreography and dance, and she worked with a lot of dance companies, right? So that was very natural. And then secondly, you said that the two of you worked very collaboratively. A lot of composers who are working in new styles, maybe uh, stuff that they've never dealt with before, materials that they never dealt with before, or an instrument maybe which is, uh, has new complexities that they've never heard in the past, oftentimes they'll work in a collaborative fashion with the performers because the performers are really educating them in many ways of what the capabilities and the possibilities of the instrument are. Because the things you're doing are not things that have been part of the vernacular for 100, 200, 150 years, right? But they're things that really come from you as an uh, individual performer. Well, I would, I would actually say uh, 
it was through the working together that some of these sounds came. I mean, um, it w it, I was I was doing a lot of this work with Eleanor at the time that I was doing the um, research for for the Oboe Unbound book. I see. And um, there are sounds that she helped me come to to learn about that that uh, or to develop that um, mm -hmm. I would not have come uh, I would not have thought of them on my own. We're going to have a second performance of this piece in a few moments, but I thought before we did that, uh, could you talk a little bit about your uh, very important uh, position that you have at Yale University? Well, thank you for saying that, and thank you for asking me about that. Um, I That's my job. I'm interviewing you. <laughs> Well, it's sort of, sort of Asia's funny. job is to make sure it gets on the air. <laughs> um, uh, and, well, it's funny because, of course, uh, I, I'm an interviewer, so so to be to interview the interviewer is always sort of a, a little little shocking, um, and and in 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 uh, in an informal way, I'll say that this is the dream job because Yale pays me to study music and talk to people about mm -hmm. it. So what's not to love about that? Beautiful. Um, but uh, the, the formal answer is I'm the director of oral history of American music, which is a, uh, an, or, an or operation that has been in existence for a little over 50 years. And um, we have interviews with, uh, we started, uh, it was founded by Vivian Perlis, very important mm -hmm. uh, person. Very important. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and she was really interested in, in Western composers um, she retired in 2010, and I became director. I, I, and the other book that you asked about earlier was the book I wrote with Vivian uh, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, using the materials from the collection. Um, and uh, when I became director, I, I was able, we finally had some stable funding, and so I was able to expand in the realm of, of jazz figures. And so all of a sudden, you had to have this question of, what is a composer? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that needed to be examined and, and, uh, and looked at. And I'm very thrilled to say that right now um, Yale has uh, opened up this Institute for Music and the Black Church. Mm. Uh, brilliant man, Dr. Braxton Shelley is is organizing that, and he and I have been working together now for two years uh, to begin to start documenting gospel figures. Beautiful. And this has been fantastically interesting and mind blowing. Good, 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 good. So, so the the collection now has about three thousand interviews and, and uh, more than three thousand. But um, you know, with well, you know, uh, one of the things that of course uh, keeps us uh, so engrossed in our musical career is that the learning possibilities are never ending, right? Uh, you're learning now about black gospel music. I'm studying Indonesian gamelan music, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I always find that so regrettable with those people who spent their whole life listening to music in a small little box. And that's why one of the reasons why I always say um, uh, when you're listening to this program, this program is for smart people with big ears, right? <laughs> big ears because you're listening to lots of different kinds of stuff. But you know, I'm going to just jump in and say, you can, you can have that same experience if all you're doing is listening to Bach. I mean, you could go a lifetime getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So, I mean, it's great to, to go with gospel and Well, Indonesia that'll be another and interview. We'll discuss <laughs> that, Libby. <laughs> okay, sounds good. We're going to have Libby do a second performance of the name of the piece once again is? Joe Ha Q. Joe Ha Q by Eleanor Havda. And I, just a couple of things I'll just throw in there before I, I, I uh, play it again. You've talked about the sort of choreography of the breath. You've talked about um, multiphonics. She was just, she talked about excavating the sounds from mm -hmm. the instrument. She loved that word, excavating. And so there's all kinds of sounds. And also the other thing she loved, and you'll hear it, um, it's exactly what you're taught not to do in classical um, oboe technique, um, is like all the weird sounds. She called it called the mm -hmm. sound around the sound. Yeah. All the sounds that go into mm -hmm. uh, to to making making a sound. So so you hear a lot of weird air yeah. sounds and other things. Okay, I'll go. I'll go play without further Okay, we're going to hear uh, Libby once again uh, perform the piece. We are live on the uh, on Joseph Chelly C E L L I Facebook page, and uh, <laughs> it looks really really good. Thank you, Asia. We're also live on the WPKN YouTube channel. You just need to push the live button. And here we go with a second performance by Libby Van Cleave.
Thank you, Libby Van Cleve. And we're going to be wrapping up this hour. I want to thank uh, Asia Bowling for the great technical work he's done here. Thank you so much, Asia. Libby? I get Asia in some picture because he's looking so good today. Come on, Asia. <laughs> <laughs> Take a bow, baby. <laughs> thank you, Asia. Beautiful job. Yeah. And uh, all of this will be on the uh, WPKN YouTube channel for you to check out. It'll be in the archives, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so much, Libby. Uh, we're going to go out with a uh, quick cut by Laurie Anderson, and then I'm going to be coming back with my Sound Print Asia program. So please stay tuned for that.